142. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 den denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? You'll bow with me. Father in heaven, <clears throat> Lord, as we read your word and study it, Lord, help us to take to heart the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus Christ humbled himself and gave up heaven to live an example, to, to show us the way, to teach us the truth. Lord, not to abolish the law, but expound upon the law so that we would understand even more and, and then give us the power of the Holy Spirit to live, Lord, that your words would be written upon our hearts. May our minds be renewed as we do uh, turn away from the things of this world and turn to our eyes towards Jesus, Lord. Help us to be in step with the Spirit, to understand what the, fruit, the, the gifts of the Spirit are, Lord, to be fruitful in the Spirit. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Let the, our e eyes and ears be open to hear what the Spirit says. In Jesus' name we say, pray, amen. Kind of tongue-tied this morning, so hopefully I won't be too bad. If you didn't get a devotional, make sure you get a devotional. Uh, don't take this wrong, but I'm not going to spoon feed you with it this year. I did it last year where I was like, here, there's broccoli on your plate. Make sure you eat your broccoli. And here's why we eat our broccoli each week and how we apply that to our lives and help how it builds. I might be preaching something out of devotional. I might be preaching something over the reading plan. I might not. Uh, right now, I'm, my heart is in Luke because I didn't get to spend much time with it at all, and that was the last thing we read at the end of the year. And you saw the scripture this morning from Luke chapter 7. One of the things that I did preach about a little bit during that time, too, was when Jesus asked the question, Who do I say that I am? Here we are in the beginning of a new year, 2024, the year of our Lord, the, the year that He may return. <laughs> Sean and I talk about that all the time. If you want to talk about it, I'll tell you why I think he might return this year. But no man knows what hour, and we're supposed to be ready, watching, and serving. And why do we do that? Because we love. If we don't love, we're not going to do it. And what greater love than we, do we possibly know, what crazy love do we know that other than what, that God's one and only Son would become flesh and blood and lay down His life for us? And he set the pattern for us that we should love as he loved. So do you remember that question? Have you answered that question? Who do you say that I am? Because that makes all the difference in the world. You don't know that you have the assurance of eternal life if you don't know who Jesus really is. You don't have the peace that surpasses all understanding. You don't have the joy that only Jesus can give if you don't know Jesus personally. So as we start out 2024 again and we think of diets and things we need to change, how is your relationship with Jesus based on who you say that he is? Is he, is, is he your king? Is he your Lord? Is he your everything? So that took me to Mark chapter 10, not Luke. So if you want to look at Mark chapter 10, I'm just going to briefly go through this. Verse 17 to 31, and I'm going to be... T uh, quoting or reading from the Berrien Study Bible is what I'm going to be doing. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up and knelt before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, that's a question all of us are going to face at one point in our life. And like I said, it's based on one simple answer. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because Jesus said, I am the only way, the only truth, the only life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And as we read through the Gospel of Luke, we found so many people interested in who Jesus was, and they wanted a part of what Jesus could offer, wanted to be associated with Jesus, or as my uh, sermon title says, they wanted to sit at the table with Jesus. But did they know who Jesus was intimately? Or did they know about Jesus? Did they want to associate with, with Him? 
So what must you do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers in verse 18, Why do you call me good? Jesus replied. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not cheat others. Honor your father and your mother. As I read this, I don't know if you remember everything from where uh, that parable Mark read us this morning from Luke appears or not. But Luke wrote that orderly account so that we would know what we believe. And then he continued the work in the uh, um, book of Acts, or Acts of the Apostles, or I like to say Acts of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles and other men. He wrote this so that we would understand what we believe, why we believe it, what it looks like in true life, living it out. He wrote this orderly account. And here is this young gentleman, and he's, this account's found in the three different Gospels, according, uh, also in Luke, where this young, rich ruler who had everything that the world offered was a godly man, and he pretty much kept these commandments. Jesus doesn't argue with him that he kept these commandments or anything. I mean, you might try your best to live live a good, moral, religious, godly life. You may have all the zeal and love for God, but if you don't know Jesus, you will spend an eternity apart from Him. That's why I started with this passage. Teacher, he replied, I have, I, all these I have kept from my youth. No better example of somebody that looks like they will have eternal life. But Jesus looked at him, and when you see that, usually it implies that he looked at him with compassion, with love. <clears throat> and it says, Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, There is one thing you lack. Well, then that matters, doesn't it? Because if I lack one simple thing, I miss the mark. If I lack one thing, and the question I ask is, What must I do to have eternal life? And I lack one thing, I miss eternal life. One thing you lack, sell everything that you own and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Because his heart belonged to the world. His heart belonged to things. Power, prestige, money, whatever it was. His heart did not belong to Jesus. He could live as morally acceptable life as it is, but he's still going to fall short because all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. And the wages of sin, what we do with this life that is not our own. We were created beings in the first place. And if we're redeemed, how our life is so much not our own because it was purchased back from hell, from death, eternal death. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, then you will have treasures in heaven. So on top of that, he's saying, get rid of this love that you have and you'll have greater things. Then come and follow me. Because then you can truly follow me because your heart will be focused on me. But the man was saddened by these words and he went away in sorrow because he had great wealth. So he walked away from Jesus that day. We don't know what else of the story. We don't know anything that happened. But that day, if he was called home, if that's what you want to call it, his home would have been hell because he walked away from Jesus no matter how moral he was. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, we are so rich and blessed in this country, and so, much, uh, so many times it's a distraction for us to live a life the way that we should for our Maker, for our Lord, for our Redeemer, for our friend. <clears throat> and the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus, be, Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They, they were even more astonished and said to one another, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. I love that verse, but it gets taken out of context so much. It simply means there is no way you can save yourself. But if you let God save you, He will. All you've got to do is believe. Childlike faith. Children, listen up. All you've got to do is believe. But if you truly believe this gift that I have given you, wouldn't you then, out of faith, respond in love? James says that you can't show me your faith without your deeds. 
It's a product of what you believe. If you love your spouse, you will love them for richer or poorer, for better or for worse. You will love them till death do you part. That's a covenant between a man and a woman. Not anything in comparison to the love that God has given you and the covenant relationship you should have back with Him to love Him and love only Him, to have no other lovers. <clears throat> Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. I, I, certainly you can see this. You can see my actions that I've left everything and followed you. But I could have left everything again and followed you again out of a religious commitment, not out of a love affair. But Peter had a love affair. He didn't understand it yet at this point. And his faith increases. And we see how much, when the Holy Spirit did come upon him, how much of a difference he made in the growth of the, the beginning and the growth of the church. <clears throat> Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters, mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundredfold in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Oh, why did that, along with persecutions, have to be in there? <coughs> Isn't it just supposed to be easy? I'm saved and everything's supposed to be good now. I love that prosperity gospel, but that prosperity gospel is a lie. Jesus' gospel says, I will be persecuted. I will suffer and die at the hands of men. Will you follow me? Peter, do you love me? I will follow you, Lord. No, you'll deny me. But Jesus reinstated him, didn't he? And gave him the power to live. A power to live a life that was purchased by Jesus' blood on the cross. A power to live like I couldn't live before and to change my mind and, the, and let me understand the laws written upon my heart now so that I can live for God because I love the one who first loved and gave himself for me. If you're not loving, it's not shown in the way that you love others. Jesus said, you will be known by the way that you love one another. And then it, Jesus adds, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Boy, that's even more suffering than the suffering part we have to have. Because many, like this young ruler, who looked like he had everything going for him. And if you wanted to go ask anybody about the law or how to live, if you were looking for a moral example, here he is. If you look for somebody that seemed to really love the Lord, here he is. But you know, a lot of those that look like they're first will be last. I mean, not even knowing what that means fully. Do you want to be last? <laughs> Why would you even run the race to finish last? To be a loser. And what was the question again? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you understand this passage? <clears throat> You understand the implications here? There's a question that everyone asks, no matter where they're at in their church life, in their Christian life, in their religion. How is your relationship with the one who loves you enough to die for you, to never, ever leave you, to hold and caress you for all eternity? How is your love back to Jesus? Man, that's a crazy love story, isn't it? A story that the world can't even comprehend. They say it's foolish. Do you know that story? Are you a part of that story? How will you welcome Jesus? How will He welcome you when He comes to claim His bride? No wonder the disciples were amazed. That word doesn't even have a strong enough for us now because we are amazed at all kind of things that aren't amazing perplexed bewildered astonished who then can be saved a child that will come to Jesus and say I trust you I love you because you first love me and respond to that love Jesus assured them that those who leave the world behind, who forsake other loves, and decide to come and follow Him and serve Him, 
as King, as Lord, as Messiah. They will be rewarded in this world. May not be in the things that you used to think were rewards and valuable, but there will be, oh, peace and joy and hope. If you don't have anything else, if you are rotting in a jail somewhere being beaten, persecuted, you'll have the peace that only God can bring, the joy that only Jesus can put into your life, and a hope that no one can take away. And then you will have eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. A lot of people will be shocked on that day. Matthew 6, verse 9 to 15. So then, this is how you should pray. You know this. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus gave that longer sermon, it wasn't really, well, it wasn't long compared to me anyway, right? <laughs> gave that longer sermon up on the hillside, and He way talked about things incredibly stronger than what I would just think about reading the law and trying to do it myself. I mean... If I've had anger in my heart, I'm guilty of murder. He said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Is that your prayer? And again, I want to start with this at the first of the year so that you think about this. Are, are, do you want God's name honored and revered above all names? Is He your Father? Do you have a right relationship with Him because of Jesus Christ? Do you want His kingdom to come and His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? What about give us this day our daily bread? Would you be satisfied with just daily bread? Are you like this man who loves the things of the world more than he loves God? Oh, in verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Some say trespasses or sin could be there. Oh, sin is your debt to God. All are guilty. And the wages of sin, what you do with this life that you've been given, each and every breath you take that comes from God, whether you know Him personally or not, you are accountable for. I've said it before, uh, just use this because it's the only thing I can think of, and it's not even near comparable. If I created an ant <laughs> and an ant bit me, I would squash the ant. <laughs> And there's no comparison to an ant to me, to me, to God. I am so insignificant compared to God Almighty. And He knew that I would bite Him. He knew that that would cost me my life, eternal death, because I sinned against Him. And He said, that's okay. I love you enough and want a relationship enough with you that I'm going to send my son as an ant to die in your place. And all you've got to do is accept and believe that. And if you do, your life will surely show it. Forgive us our debt because it's something that we owe to God that we cannot pay ourselves, that can only be paid by someone else. And of course, that's why we forgive people that sin against us also. Because why in the world could I not forgive if I've been forgiven? Do I take that grace for, for granted so little? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men for their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men for their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Oh, the grudges that we hold so much. And again, I'm saying this the first of the year. Maybe there's some grudges that need to be got rid of. Maybe there's some peace that's not in your heart. Maybe you just can't accept that person and forgive that person. Do you understand God's forgiveness for you then? Romans 4 verse 4 says, Now the wages of the worker are not credited as a gift, but an obligation. Your life, the way you live it, is accountable to God. And with one simple sin, you're indebted to Him for your life for all eternity. And you cannot make that payment. The Greek word that's used here is ophelima, which means owed, a legal debt, a sin, an offense that must be paid. There is no way out of it. There's also another word that's used sometimes for debt. It's called misthos. 
And it's sometimes translated as punishment because it goes along with that death, but it could also be translated as reward. Because that debt that you have, if it could be pardoned or canceled, you could be rewarded instead of punished. And Jesus paid that debt for every human being, no matter how great their sin, no matter how often they sin, how nasty they look to the world, to you, to anyone else. He paid that debt for everyone, if they will only believe. You can find that word in Romans 6.23. Or you find a different word, excuse me, in Romans 6.23. It's opsineon. You know, the, you know the verse, right? For the wages of sin is death. And you've got the but, the complete opposite. The gift of God is eternal life. So you see this, this wage versus this gift, because a wage is something earned. You earn eternal death, but a gift, on the other hand, from God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. But if you didn't realize it, Paul here is talking about a soldier, one who is hired for the Lord's army, right? That's why I tell you this. For verse 20 of Romans 6, For when you were slaves to sin, because you belonged, you served someone, you were free of the obligation to righteousness. What fruit did you reap at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. We quote Romans 6, 23 all the time, but look at the verses coming up to before it. But now that you have been set free from sin and become a slave to God, you're enlisted in the Lord's army. The fruit you reap leads to holiness, and the outcome is eternal life. So if you have believed in Jesus Christ, you can't stay, as some religions claim, you can't stay in your sin and just keep sinning on and on because you don't really believe then. First of all, you're holy, you're sanctified, set apart for God's purpose. You're in His army, you serve Him. Your wages that you're earning are now for the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Are you living for Him? But the only way you're going to understand this and do this and serve the commander-in-chief is if you love Him because you realize what He's done for you. Otherwise, you'll still be longing back for that other kingdom that you used to serve. For the wages of your sin, I added your in there, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So who do you say that I am? Really, who do you say that Jesus is with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength? After the Beatitudes in, in Luke's uh, gospel, or the blessings, there are some woes that come up, and I'm leading us up to the Luke, Luke chapter 7. I'm in Luke 6, 24. But woe to you who are rich. Oh, you see this pattern again? For you have already received your comfort. Rich, you have a place to go lay your head down. I mean, that's what rich was in those days, and it still is in this world today if you look at the whole. At the whole. Rich because you don't have to worry about daily bread. Rich because you have security when you lay down at night that you don't have to fear for your life. So many don't have that in this world. You are rich because you have your comfort now. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers treated the false prophets in the same way. What did they do with the real prophets? Oh, I don't like your message. <laughs> your message is repent and turn to God and quit doing these things. But I love these things so much. Let's kill the real prophets and let's follow the false prophets. Still happening today. <clears throat> did the young rich man not know these words? Did he not hear these words? Did he not read and study the prophecies in the Old Testament? that all pointed to Jesus? Did he not understand how to live just because he had head knowledge instead of heart knowledge? Oh, now we're getting up to this guy named Simon who was a Pharisee who wanted to point fingers at this adulterous woman. Luke 7, verse 41 and 42. Two men were debtors. So this is why I put you up to what this debt meant of a, to a certain money lender. Ah, oh, who's a certain money lender? God, period, in this story. 
You can put yourself in any of these other positions, but your debt is to God. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Boy, that's a big difference, 10 times. That's a day's wage, basically, is what that is. One owed 50 days' worth of work again, as a soldier needs to work, and one owed him 500. But neither one could pay for whatever reason. Oh, wait a minute. We want to put in here whatever reasons. What if he was lazy? What, what, what if he was a drunkard? It doesn't matter. Neither one could pay, period. Oh, it's because of a crisis in their life. It's because of cancer. It doesn't matter. Neither one could pay their debt. No one can pay their sin debt to God. There's, I forgot how much, $67 trillion in the world. Your debt's more than that. <laughs> it's, I don't know what's after a trillion, quadzillion? It's not even that. One sin against God. There is no way that you can pay that debt. It doesn't matter how many denarii it is. When they were unable to repay him, he forgave both of them. He pardoned the debt. So here's the question. Which one then will love him more? I mean, that's a pretty simple answer that a child can figure out again. And, and Simon gets it, but he doesn't get it, right? The Pharisees at a, as a whole owed a huge debt. We all owe a debt. But they were religious hypocrites. It's easy for us to see that now looking and reading. But is it easy for us to see our religious hypocrisy in our own lives, in our own church? How many times have you pointed fingers at that scandalous woman? How many times have you said, I keep all of the law? How many times have you taken for granted the gift of eternal life given to you through Jesus Christ. So instead of loving Him, you put your faith and trust in other things. And you said, not now, Lord, I need to do this or that. Oh, but what if I don't have this or that? How can I do this? Oh, I don't have these gifts and abilities. Where is your faith? I mean, Jesus had to say, how much longer must I put up with this world? The lack of faith doesn't matter how zealous you are for God, how much you have works of righteousness, how much obedience you have to the law. Everyone is indebted to God for their sin, and so were the Pharisees. Now, we like to give them a bad rap, but remember in their day, this is who the people would have looked to. I spent an hour or so talking to a young lady yesterday. She told me a little of her story, and I'm not going to say a lot. And she's... A, a, been pronounced that she's going to be dying soon and she said it's just terrible that so many people want to point fingers at me and say it's because of this and she says you know what a lot of it is because of this the things I did before sins have consequences things we do have consequences but why would you want to point any fingers at anyone the one sin you have committed will lead to your eternal death and what the point was there that I'll say was is she felt betrayed by the Christians who pointed fingers at her. And my answer back to her was, look at Christ, not look at the Christians. Because He hasn't betrayed you. He will never forsake you. He loves you beyond anything you can fathom. And yeah, sins have consequences, and maybe this because of that, maybe this isn't because of that. We live in a fallen world where it, it, sin has consequences, period. There is death, there is disease, there is famine, there's things atrocious that happen in this world all the time. And what you can do, do something about. What you can't, don't do anything about except pray. But don't point fingers. The Pharisees liked to point fingers because they thought they were more religious. Don't fall into that trap. But not all of them were that way. There was a man named Nicodemus, wasn't there? And we don't know this about Simon, how he was or anything. But before you point fingers, make sure that you pull the moat or the log out of your eye so that you can help the other person. So this Pharisee that we don't know, Simon, 
I want to throw out, first of all, we don't know, and if you read commentaries, you know, a lot of them will take this prejudice going in. He was this way. We don't know why he invited Jesus at his, to his home. But I'll give you a little thought process behind as we go through it. But he did. And he's sitting at the table with Jesus. And what I want you to see is what the Pharisee did not do to show love and what this adulterous, scandalous woman did do to show love. Okay? And why did she show it? Why did he not show it? Because she realized the gift that God gave her of eternal life, pardoning her through this Messiah, this man, the Christ known as Jesus. She accepted it by faith. So I'm going to read the passage and then we'll go through it just a little bit more in depth. Luke 7, verse 36 to 50. Then one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a sinful woman from that town learned that Jesus was dining there, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. Then she kissed his feet and anointed them with perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, Is this man, If this man were a prophet, he would know who this is and what kind of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner. But Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men were debtors to a certain money lender. One, owned him, one owed him 500 denarii and another 50. When they were unable to repay him, he forgave both of them. Which one of them when, then will love him more? I suppose the one who was forgiven more, Simon replied. You have judged correctly. Jesus said and turned towards a woman. He said, to, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not greet me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I arrived. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, because her many sins have been forgiven, she has loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those at the table began to say to themselves, Who is this? There's that again. Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus told the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. <clears throat> so let's start with verse 36. Oh, let's start with Luke again, writing this orderly account. Do you know this is his first parable? Yeah, maybe, you know, parables are hard to determine which ones are parables sometimes. Because do you count when he, Jesus talks about the wine and the, and the wine flask? Well, he's given an example here, but it's not really a parable. This is a definition of a parable because it's, hey, I've got a teaching illustration for you. Let me tell you this story. And if Luke is writing this way as a doctor and figuring all this, this is the first parable that he puts out there of Jesus. To back up, who do you say that I am? Because if you say that Jesus is the Messiah, that He offered you eternal life, if you have been pardoned of your sin, then you will love in return because of the love given you. No matter where you're at in the equation of how big a sinner, how little of a sinner, you will be flabbergasted by the atrocious, uh, outlandish love that Jesus has given to you. And I say atrocious and outlandish because it just seems like, wow, how could God do this, especially for this sinner? <laughs> this sinner. I'm not talking about the woman. What love. And so we get to this point where this Pharisee invites him in. There's no saying that he's doing it to trap him written here or anything else. This could have been like where Nicodemus comes in John. As we start out the Gospel of John, we don't see that the Pharisees are all, all bad. We see that the Pharisee comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want to be exposed. Now this Pharisee's invited him into dinner, but it's his house, he's safe, there's other people there, and in the day of that time you came down and reclined, like if you look at pictures of the Last Supper, you don't see them sitting in chairs, you reclined. And your feet were in the faces of other people somewhat. And you got, had your feet washed because it was what you did. It was customary. And it was customary to greet the person with a kiss and to anoint them with some oil. You're welcoming into your home. You're being hospitable. And we're supposed to practice hospitality, right? And if anyone was going to be hospitable, the Pharisee was going to be even more hospitable than others. 
And they didn't shut out the message. They let the people hear from outside in the courtyard and everywhere, but they didn't, weren't going to invite them in their homes, right? Okay? So this Pharisee has invited Jesus into his home. Verse 36, And one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. We don't know his name yet. We just know that one Pharisee has. We don't know anything good or bad about the Pharisees that much, but there has been the woe given to them. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Nothing bad, no, no trap here or anything. There's a dinner invitation, and Jesus is accepted. Why did he invite Jesus? We don't know. But from the Scripture more, it looks like to me, he wanted to find out, especially how the passage ends, who this man really was. Maybe he was going to entrap him. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he would make a decision for himself. Maybe he wouldn't, as we see on. He didn't at this point. Maybe he'll come later, like in the, in the Gospel of John, when Nicodemus finally came around. We don't know. And we only have this story in Luke. Verse 37, When a sinful woman from that town learned that Jesus was dining there, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. What's her motivation? Was she planning on coming in the house? Was she planning on just coming to the doorway? She brought a perfume. Why did she bring her perfume? We know that she's a sinful woman, and we learn more about her sinfulness in a little bit when they point fingers at her. But she's a sinful woman, and she brings an alabaster jar of perfume. Well, a sinful woman could mean that she's guilty of any kind of sins, but as we read on in the story, it seems like she's more considered a lady of the night. We'll just say that. And that this alabaster jar of perfume, or yours might have ointment, but it was perfume, was probably what she used to lure her men in. She probably wore it as a flask around her neck. It was a, probably a costly perfume. She was probably good at her job, all probablys, okay? And this was her security that she wore around her heart, close to her heart, because this is how she got fed and paid and how she felt worth and whatever she did. I don't know her mind again. But that day she decided to come and see who Jesus really was. She had in her heart, in her mind, who, she, who, who Jesus was. So she made these preparations. Did she plan on doing what happened next? I don't know. I just know this. She was a condemned sinner who came to Jesus to see what he would offer. Verse 38, as she stood behind him, so she's made her way already in. No one has stopped her yet. Surprising that they didn't because they would have said, what in the world are you doing here? But I guess they watched to see what Jesus would do. Maybe this is what Simon's doing at this point. Well, let's see. Because certainly Jesus will tell her to get out of here because he's not out in the town square now. He's in, in my home. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. And if you look at that a little bit more, it is wailing, weeping, showering him. She began to wet his feet like you're taking a shower with her tears and wipe them with her hair. Then she kissed his feet and anointed them with perfume. Did she plan on doing this? I don't know. But broken people do crazy things, don't they? Out of love. I don't think she planned on doing all this. I think she got to the feet of Jesus and said, Thank you. Wow, I'm in the presence of God. And he died. He was, she didn't know that yet. But he laid down his life for me so that I can be purchased back and be a child of God. So she broke out in weeping. So much that, what's she going to do now? She's wet Jesus' feet. Oh, well, they're dirty in the first place because Simon didn't show him any gratitude or hospitality. Well, what am I going to do? <coughs> Sorry. I didn't plan this because I didn't bring a towel with me. Even Jesus planned when he got up from the Last Supper and took off his outer garment for a towel. She lets her hair down. That's not something you do in public. That's something you do in private as a woman of that day. It is your beauty, your glory, your dignity. Although she used it in a way she should have never used it, she takes her hair down, exposing herself, and wipes his feet with her hair. Would you do that? 
It's hard to get people to wash other people's feet, let alone use their hair to dry. Hey, let's, let's do that for a foot washing. Who wants to participate? <laughs> it's okay. I don't have enough hair to really dry. I guess you had to get down there then. and Maybe she had really long hair. That would be a blessing that day, right? <clears throat> and then when she was done drying them, or maybe, maybe she wasn't totally dry them, she kissed his feet. That's something more like a dog would do to his master. She didn't care what anybody thought about her. And then she anointed him with a perfume. Wait a minute. This was her security. This was her savings. This was how she made income. She sold all she had and gave it to Jesus so she could follow Jesus. See where I read the other one first? You don't have to give it to the poor necessarily. That's, that's a great thing to do if you have monetary. But she said, I'm not going to use this anymore as my support. I'm giving it all to you. She probably never poured that perfume out anywhere before. She probably just opened the class so that the smell, the aroma would be on her and in the room. But now she poured it out on Jesus' feet. She was broken. She came to worship, didn't even probably know it at first. She gave up everything to fully serve Jesus. And it obviously showed. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this is and what kind of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner. I told you we'd learn a little bit more about the sinner. He's <clears throat> influencing even more that she's not just a sinner, She's a professional sinner. She's like the tax collector. She is a lady of the night. And if Jesus were a man from God, he would know who's touching him. Well, let me tell you something, Simon. He read your mind. <laughs> I believe he is God. <clears throat> Why would we want to point fingers? Do we in our religious hypocrisy think we are better than we are? Are we so secure in our standing that we might just be ready for a fall even if we are saved? Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is touching Jesus? Who is giving their allegiance to Jesus? Who is letting nothing stop them from being embarrassed? No financial support left behind? They're just giving it all at the feet of Jesus. This sinful woman why a man zealous for God and zealous for the law is watching and pointing fingers saying I'm not a sinner like that does the greatness of sin matter well sin has consequences and there are greater sins than others well, it's a topic for a different day but when it matters for eternity no if you're guilty of one little lie as Paul says you have broken the law and the penalty is eternal death. But I'm a Christian. Or am I a Christian Pharisee sometimes? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Verse 40, but Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. So Jesus interjects because he reads Simon's mind. And listen to what he says. And, and Simon doesn't show him any disregard here or anything. He says, teacher, tell me. Now, we don't know if that's mockingly or not, but I, I think at this point, Simon is still interested in who Jesus is, but he's flabbergasted that Jesus would let a sinner like this touch him because of his own self-righteousness. And boy, that's where it really starts to slam me in the story. Sorry, that's where it's at. Because so many times I think that. Not as bad maybe as this Pharisee, but it doesn't matter again. If I've had that one adulterous thought I am guilty of adultery so Jesus said two men were debtors with a certain money lender one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50 I explained that a little bit more a little bit before, earlier that's 50 days wages or 500 days of wages 50 days of wages that's almost too much. That's a long time to pay off the debt. And it's going to take me a lot more than that because I've got to live during that time. So to pay off 50 days worth of debt, I'm going to have to work probably 200 if I can pay 25% of my income back and live off the other 75. 
But the other one's 500 days. So does that mean that I'm going to have to work 2,000 days? That would be six, almost six years. That's a long time. Well, let me tell you this. You can't work six days in any Christian service and pay off your debt. You can't do anything. And who says you'll have tomorrow in the first place? Who says you have six years? Who says you have six minutes? Each and every breath is a gift of God. Are you loving Him because He first loved you? So this scenario is ten times different, but what if it was ten million times different? Would it make any matter? I guess the matter matters to us a little, but when it comes to sin debt again, we're all guilty. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We all deserve the wages of our sin, which is eternal death. When they were unable to repay him, doesn't say why, anything else, he forgave both of them. Why? Why would the guy forgive? Oh, well, let's look with not physical eyes, but let's look with spiritual eyes because of who God is. Hallowed be his name, his kingdom come, his will be done. But here's the question, which one of them will love him more? Both are unable to pay for whatever reason. Maybe he just didn't want to pay. It doesn't matter what the reason is again, does it? It matters that this person who lent them the money is willing to forgive any kind of debt, any size. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that anyone who will believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. What's the loan of your life worth? Who are you serving your life with? Uh, who do you owe for your life? Each and every breath. Simon's answer. I suppose the one who was forgiven more. I suppose. <laughs> now that puts a lot into it. <laughs> I know the truth. It's put out right in front of me, and I want to sit back there and say, yeah, this love your enemy thing, I agree with it. I ain't going over there to that guy. I suppose. I got a little bit of comprehension in my mind, but it sure hasn't penetrated my heart. I'm surely not letting the Spirit guide me I'm surely not loving others because I don't know the love that was given to me. And I don't really love the Lord my God, especially with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. Jesus replied, you have judged correctly. It's like that one who was trying to test Jesus that said, well, who is my neighbor? And he answered correctly, and Jesus said, then go and do likewise. <laughs> Pretty simple. Aren't you glad, really glad, that your life's debt has been paid to God through Jesus Christ? Then if you are, look at this woman. Turning, verse 44, turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Jesus looked at the woman, because he's speaking to the woman, but yet he's trying to make his point to Simon, because the woman already has it figured out. So I'm saying, Barry... Your sins are forgiven, you know it. Listen up, Simon, because I still want you to come to grace. Do you see this woman? Yeah, you see her with your eyes, but are you looking at her heart like I look? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You remember at that, what we call the Last Supper? Jesus said, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, because I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set an example so that you should do as I have done for you. This woman did it for Jesus before he ever even gave the example because her heart was just focused on worshiping. Truly, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. 
you know, when she heard those words later, if she ever heard those words, think about how much they meant to her because she already was practicing it. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How grateful are you for the love that Jesus gave you? Are you following his example? Are you known by the love that you have? You know, it's easy to look in the scriptures and spot Pharisees. Not quite as easy if you do self-examination. Verse 45, You did not greet me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I arrived. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. So he's calling Simon out for not having a servant wash his feet. Not, Not Simon doing it. He's calling Simon out for not giving him a handshake as we would do today. Welcome. They did it with a brotherly kiss. And he's calling him out because he didn't give him a little bit of oil to anoint or like if you come and can I get you a glass of tea? That's the things that that Simon didn't do for Jesus. Are you doing those things for Jesus? Then he says what the woman does. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She has not stopped kissing my feet since I arrived. Not just kiss, she's she's not stopped kissing them since I arrived. And she has anointed my feet with perfume. To do all those things, when we read the scripture earlier, it said the woman stood behind Jesus. That means she had to get down and do it. She had to humble herself before God to serve him in a radical, loving way, which Simon wouldn't understand because he didn't love God that way in his heart. Therefore, I tell you, because her many sins have been forgiven, she has loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. And don't take this out of context. It's not because of what she did. It's because she did what she did because she already had been forgiven. She had found grace. You've got to read the whole passage to understand. There's no way that our actions that would contradict the whole thing of the debt could take care of our debt to God. But because our debts have been forgiven, how are we living our life as a result of that? Because if we're not living our lives more like this woman and we're living them more like this Pharisee, then there's probably a good chance that our debts really haven't been forgiven. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Wow. You have eternal life. You have been pardoned because you believed in me. And it's obvious because of the way you show your loving affection to me. Now, what do you think she did when she walked out of the room? You know that she could have gone right back to the way she lived before. She could have just lived a half-hearted Christian life. I don't think so. If she came in and did all that in front of all these people and didn't worry about anything, she really sold everything she had so that she could come and follow Jesus. Verse 49, but those at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? There, we're back to that question of who do you say that I am? And verse 50, and Jesus told the woman, your faith has saved you. There it is, faith. Go in peace. So where did she go to? I think back to the man that had the legion of demons and was cast out in the pigs. There was two men there that day, you know. We don't know what happened to the second one, but we know the one was told he wanted to go with Jesus so bad, and Jesus said, nope, go back and proclaim what I've done here. Do you think he went back and proclaimed? I do, because I see the change in his life. I think she went in peace, which meant she didn't need to go back to any of those things that she did before. She didn't have to worry about those sins. They didn't, she didn't have to go back tomorrow and say, oh, I'm, I'm a worthless sinner. How could, how could God ever forgive me? She had been forgiven. Her debt had been paid. She had a new life. She was a new creation in Christ. 
And I think, without a doubt, that she lived it. Now, does that mean she had highs and lows? Of course she did. Does that mean she sinned again? <laughs> yep. But she was forgiven, and her life showed it. What about Simon? We don't know. Hopefully Jesus got to his heart that day. We have no way to know. But what we can infer from this is that every one of you here, because you're here, has come to dine with Jesus at the table. How are you dining? Are you expecting to just be eating on a level playing field with Him? Are you expecting to be reclining in this world? Because that's not what Scripture says, buddying up with Jesus. <laughs> or are you realizing that you are to serve Him with the life that He has given back to you until He calls you home and says, Welcome, your sins have been forgiven. Oh, there's so many more scriptures. That might be where I go next week. You know, and I started that with, the, with being the least, being greater, and, the, and the, being a good steward, and so many other things, because we're just in the seventh chapter of Luke with the first parable that he gives. You've been invited to the table with Jesus. Do you realize what that invitation means? And have you given him your life? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, awesome, loving God who would create us and give us free will to sin against you and say, I'm going to send my son to pay that debt that anyone who believes will not perish but have eternal life. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you also that Jesus is at the right hand being our advocate and not only that, that that you have sent the Holy Spirit here to be our advocate to teach to guide Lord help us to walk in step with the Spirit Spirit renew our minds so that we don't think the same way about the things of the world write your laws on our hearts that we might not sin against you bind us together Lord that that we are united in the cause of serving Jesus and serving others. Father, we thank you and praise you for the life that you've given, for the redemptive life in Christ, for the freedom that you've given us. May we not take lightly in 2024 or ever the grace upon grace upon grace that you've given a sinner such as we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.